Let's welcome the spectacular guy, Tori, my brother. It's an honor and pleasure to have you on the show, man. Talk to me about what inspired you to make this docu-series. Thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure to be here, man. Um, you know, it, was, it, was, it had to be done, man. Um, Michael Blackson, comedian Michael Blackson, uh, about 13 years ago, you know, we were on a flight together, and he said, man, I miss Fat Tuesdays. He said, uh, the young comedians need to know about this night. And that's when a light bulb went off in my head, like, well, hmm, let, me, let me see what I, what I can do, because I love documentaries. And I just opened up the archives and see what I had. And then I started, you know, uh, doing interviews. A young director that was coming up, Bishop Moore, uh, I grabbed him, and we started doing interviews. And when I started hearing the stories of the comedians and also patrons who used to come to Fat Tuesdays, they're incredible. And I was like, I didn't realize it was that special to anybody else. And, and I put it together, and the rest was history. When you, you know, this idea of saying, I want this next generation to know about Fat Tuesdays, especially the next generation of comics, I get it. Tell me, though, like, what about Fat Tuesdays do you want them to know? What is it about it that you think they need to understand? Well, I think in any field that you're in, no matter what it is, if you're landscape, just study the history of your field. You should know where it is, where it came from, where it was, where it is today, and where it may go in the future. And this part of history, man, you know, stand-up is, is an art, and too many times we as comedians are cast off as just misfits or, or, or court jesters and clowns and buffoons, but we're way more than that. We're artists and we're creators and, and, and we're, we're therapists, basically. So this young generation now, this incredible young generation who has have social media, we're doing these sketches and doing an incredible job with the sketches and skits. That's a whole other skill set in its own, but some want to do stand-up. So they need to know where stand-up came from and the history of stand-up. And I want them to, to know that before they venture on and have the best of both worlds, the live show and their sketches that they do online. Oh, I, lo I love that idea. And I love that idea of, of having the best of both worlds to connect with. Now, when you decided to create Fat Tuesdays, uh, back in the 90s, what was your motivation? What was the comedy scene like, and what were you trying to add to it? Well, first of all, I was three years old uh, <laughs> in the 90s. I was only three. No, you know what? I understand. I, was, I, I was, was two. <laughs> there was a void uh, in the black community of industry coming to see us. And I'd already had an agent and manager, had a few credits under my belt, but there's so many other funny brothers and sisters who just weren't getting the opportunity, and I wanted to make a difference. And also, you know, if you were black in Los Angeles and you weren't a regular at the big three comedy clubs, which is the Improv, the Comedy Store, the Laugh Factory, white people made you feel like you weren't a real comedian. And I hated that feeling, and I hated how it made me feel because I wasn't a regular in those comedy clubs at the time. And it hated how it made other black comedians feel. So I wanted to create a place where we can say, come see me at the comedy store on Tuesday night. I love that, man. I love the idea of building our own stuff, creating our own space for each other so that we don't have to conform to other people's standards and other people's assessments, man. And one of the things I loved about Fat Tuesdays was that it wasn't just... Uh, new young comedians, uh, black comedians from different eras performed there. I mean, you had Chris Tucker, you had Eddie Murphy, you had the Tina Arnold goes up to Tiffany Haddish. I mean, it's interesting to see just the number and diversity of people who were in there, and it helped advance people's careers, man. I mean, how, how did you see people's kind of trajectories change when they, once they hit Fat Tuesdays? Well, Chris Tucker was still a young, budding comedian at the time, and he was one of the young ones that came through. Nick Cannon you know, came through. And Bill Bellamy was on his way to being established. My brother Joe was on his way to being established. Cedric was on his way to being established. Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle was already established, but they would drop in and work on sets. So, you know, Tiffany was a young, hungry comedian trying to get on stage, but she wasn't ready. And, you know, it, it, it became this incredible night where you on any given night without any advertising, you could see anybody from a young Kevin Hart or Cat Williams, or Corey Holcomb, to Eddie Murphy in the audience, Richard Pryor in the audience, Denzel in the audience, Prince in the audience, and then Dave Chappelle would drop in and do a guest spot. You know, 
Uh, Chris Rock was working on hosting the Oscars. He come by and work on his monologue. You know, Bob Saget and Billy Gardell and Pauly Shore and Andrew Dice Clay, who want to test the material out in the black audience without going to the hood, can come to Fat Tuesdays on Sunset at the comedy <laughs> store and see if their their material worked out in a black room. I like that. I mean, that's, that's such a fascinating story. And I, I know the docuseries covers so much of this, man. One of the things I loved about uh, Fat Tuesday also was that you created space for black women. It seemed like you were very intentional about saying that we need black women comedians on that stage. Well, definitely, I, I took a tip from my brother, Joe, who, you know, started comedy before me, and he just said, you know, you should always have at least, at least one woman on stage. And I, 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 I took that note, and and I made sure every show had at least one woman on, on stage. And, you know, it's very hard in the women, for women, period, in the work in the workplace, especially in a male-dominated field like comedy in Hollywood. And unfortunately, there's a lot of quid pro quo when it comes to, you know, female comics. And I wasn't running my show like that. You know, you didn't have to give up any tail just to get some time. So I wanted to make sure it was a safe place for them to come and they could do their material and relax and have to worry about you know, quid pro quo. Man, I love that, man. Again, tr building something for us that's filled with dignity and safety and respect and love. Man, that's what made the thing last. That's what made the thing work. And that's why this docuseries is amazing. Man. But I got to ask you a question before you go, right? Because, you know, every generation thinks the next generation ain't got it, right? And then the young cats of every generation think they better than the cats that came before. We see it in basketball, baseball, activism, politics, the church. I gotta ask you now what you think about this new generation of black comedians. Which are, are they? Are they? Are they as good as y'all? Are they as good as they used to be? Is something missing? What do you think? There's nothing missing. They have another outlet where they're channeling creativity. You know, there's some young ones that are that are making some noise in the game. You know, like Ha Ha Davis, DC Young Fly, Carlos Miller, Chico Bean, uh, Miss Pretty Ricky, Ty Davis. Uh, you know, there's some young men and women that are making strides and making some noise in the comedy game, and I love it. And, you know, they're, they're a little bit more distracted than we are because we didn't have social media. All we had was stand-up. You know, some of us had TV and film, too, but this whole social media thing is a whole nother way. The grind is different. Like, when we started, we had to build our act first and then build our audience. The new comedians have a different advantage where they can build their audience first and then work on building their act, or building their set. So they just have to put the reps in. And that's all my message is to the, the young guns, is get them reps in, get on stage. There's nothing like being live and on stage because, again, you can have the best of both worlds, and live money and that sketch money, and then you can go do other things and then pay it forward. Because the next generation after them, they're gonna have a different way, a different portal into the business. And I, I respect my predecessors, I respect my, 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 my contemporaries, and I respect the future generation. And I think we should bridge a gap and help each other. Help us old school how to do social media. And we'll mentor y'all on this stand up <laughs> game and really getting that grind on. I love that, man. I love the, the generational love, the generational support, man, and never letting go of our history and our past, man. That's why this docuseries is so special because you hold on to the past, but you bridge it to the future. And that's why it's a beautiful series. It's a, it's a beautiful project. And what you built, what you created, and what you supported, and what you trumpeted is something that's going to stand the test of time in our memories, in our hearts, and in our culture, brother. So, Guy Tory, just, man, thank you so much for joining me on Black News tonight. It's an honor and pleasure talking to you. And congrats on that new docuseries. It is shining an amazing light on your contributions to the culture. Everybody, make sure you check this thing out. It's called Fat Tuesdays, the era of hip-hop comedy. And it's available right now exclusively on Amazon Prime Video. You don't want to miss it.